Islamic Committee, distinguished executives of the International Red Crescent, members of the OIC and the presidents of the Red Crescents and uh, the Red Cross organizations of the observing countries, ladies and gentlemen, my August brothers, I would like to salute you all with my most heartfelt emotions, with love and respect. Welcome to the city of Istanbul, which is the apple of the eye of the world, praised by Prophet Muhammad. As the term president of the OIC, I would like to state once again that it gives me great pleasure to be able to host you in our country, our distinguished and valuable guests. I would like to thank each and every one of you for your attendance to our gathering. I would like to extend my most heartfelt gratitude to the Turkish Red Crescent, the members of the OIC Red Network and the International Red Crescent Associations for having brought us together on the occasion of this very significant meeting. At the onset of my speech, I would like to congratulate the 150th anniversary of the Turkish Red Crescent as well as the 100th anniversary of the International Red Crescent and the Red Cross Associations Federation. About 150 years ago, the Red Crescent, known by the name Hilali Ahmar Association, was established in order to extend a helping hand to all those who were feeble and who were in need. And I would like to commemorate the founders ever so fondly, from Dr. Besim Amar to Jalal Muhtar from Safius and Erbil to Yusuf Akchura, with their tremendous efforts, with their sacrifice, and with their tremendous contributions. They have played a significant role in the establishment of Turkish Red Crescent, and I would like to remember them and their legacy ever so fondly. Without any distinction on the basis of ethnicity, religious, or race, all of the workers of the Red Crescent and the members of this network are extending a helping hand to those in need, and they deserve the greatest of gratitude. I also would like to praise the souls of those who have fallen in the defense of the feeble and the oppressed, all of the martyrs that we commemorate ever so fondly will live on forever. I hope and pray that the meetings and the side events will contribute to a brighter future for each and every one of us unfolding a new legacy ahead of us. I would like to thank all of the members of the academia, all of the experts to share their field expertise with us in order to strengthen our network. I would like to thank them in advance. Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, as you know, as Turkey, ever since the year 2016, we have been the term presidents of the OIC, which is the greatest international organization right after the United Nations. In the last two and a half years, we have surmounted tremendous challenges as the Islamic world, and we have experienced very trying days. From the attacks on the legal status of Jerusalem to the Palestinian question, to the conflicts raging in Syria for the last eight years, all the way to the famine in Yemen, we have encountered many crises affecting the human life. Unfortunately, the vast majority of these crises still sustain in this day and age having transformed into even dire ones. We hear the cries of the oppressed and the feeble from the four corners of the Islamic world as we speak, especially in Yemen. The greatest man-inflicted famine is raging. According to the UN statistics, 14 million Yemeni brothers and sisters are on the brink of famine and drought, and they are trying to provide themselves a sustenance to prevail. We see depictions of children who are 
emaciated on screens and they are the most heartbreaking symbols of the trying times that we encounter. Unfortunately, the Islamic world hasn't risen up to the occasion to fight back these crises raging our own very geographies. And on the other hand, in Syria, more than a million lives were lost and more than 12 million Syrians had to be displaced, leaving their motherlands behind. And the oppression and the tyranny, despite our countries, as a result of our country's tremendous efforts, thankfully was mitigated slightly. Praise Allah, after many years in the making, as a result of the Astana discussions, some concrete steps have been taken forward in order to establish a permanent political solution in Syria. With operations such as Euphrates Shield and Olive Branch, we fought against organizations such as Daesh, PKK, and YPG, which are not imposing a clear and a present danger on the national security of only Syria, but also Turkey. In Syria, there is almost no presence whatsoever left of Daesh. We know that the remainders of Daesh are in the Syrian territory today. They were left behind there in order to legitimize the very presence of terrorist organizations such as PKK and YPG. I think Daesh has become just another actor in the field serving the very purposes of some international forces who are trying to garner their own interests and their benefits. Daesh and the regime killed millions of civilians fleeing bombs and fleeing attacks of the tyranny and the oppression. And these terrorist organizations have not only commissioned attacks in their own lands, but also in my country. These organizations are still involved in terrorist attacks, and the Western civilizations came to notice their raison d'etre just after they have attacked their own metropolitan cities. Just because terrorist organizations are allegedly fighting Daesh, they cannot be legitimized because they are bombing mosques, altars, schools, and they are killing children and civilians. However, these terrorist organizations are benefiting from thousands and thousands of trucks filled with ammunition and weapons. We have seen footages from Raqqa last year only to depict the dark and the very dirty alliance between different forces in the field. On the pretext of fighting Daesh, some terrorist organizations such as PKK and YPG have been heavily armed and they were supported and they were allowed to abandon Raqqa bearing the weapons given to them by Daesh terrorists. Even more crucial than that, PYD and YPG terrorist organization used some Daesh terrorists and trained some Daesh terrorists armed those terrorists in order to use them against our country. As Turkey, God willing, we will be able to eradicate the remainders of Daesh once and for all, along with all of the Daesh terrorists purposefully trained to fight Turkey. Just as we have secured many regions, the eastern part of Euphrates will embrace peace, stability, and prosperity once and for all. In order for that to be possible, we are still establishing close contacts with the countries with powers in the field, such as the US and Russia. We have had exploratory talks with all of the parties involved in a positive fashion. As we were investing in our diplomatic efforts, we were preparing our next step forward. In this process, our eventual goal is to strengthen our national security along with ensuring the territorial integrity of Syria. Within the first phase, we hope and pray that we will be able to establish safe zones or D zones whereby some of the 3.6 million refugees which are currently in our country can return safely. Until so far, more than 300,000 Syrian brothers and sisters returned to districts such as Azaz, Elbab, Jarablus, and Afrin, where our country 
eradicated all forms of terrorist presence. The D zones we will establish along our southern border, we hope and pray that the returns will reach levels of millions of inhabitants. Distinguished brothers and sisters, Turkey is investing tremendous efforts in order to not only eradicate terrorist presence in Syria, but also eradicate the ramifications of the humanitarian crises caused by the conflict. From Somalia to Aragon, from Gaza to Yemen, we are extending a helping hand to all of the oppressed and all of the feeble in our region. While we are sustaining our humanitarian efforts, we are not making a distinction on the basis of the faith, of the ethnicity, of the language, and the color of the skin of those in need. That's why we have opened our doors wide to millions of refugees fleeing the attacks of the regime in Syria. We haven't labeled anyone as Christian. We have never labeled anyone as Aramic. We have never called anyone Yazidi. We have opened our doors wide and we cater to all of their needs from healthcare to education to nourishment or food. We have not condemned the refugees to islands or to concentration camps, just like many Western states have done. These people had to leave their motherlands behind, and we have not treated them as if they were leopards, just like many Western countries have done, who are actually pretending to be the beacons of democracy and human rights. And those countries are unfortunately isolating the refugees, blaming them for the problems that they have encountered in their homelands, and some of the politicians in the Western world are fighting the refugees in a very adversarial fashion in order to garner some political gains. And all around Europe, we see increasing attacks against the refugees and against different members of uh, racial backgrounds. 10,000 children have fled to Europe from the Syrian conflict, and their whereabouts still remain unknown. And when the situation was just like that in the West, we have ensured that more than 650,000 Syrian children would attend schools in our country. Whatever the health care our, our citizens received, the refugees were ensured to do the same. Until so far, we have spent more than $33 billion on refugees, according to the UN calculations, on 4 million refugees, 3.6 million of which are of Syrian descent. The EU committed to certain pledges, but those pledges were never honored. The UNHCR, unfortunately, allocated only infinitesimal amounts for the refugees. And these amounts are not allocated and they are not wired to our national budget. These funds are being mobilized in the field through international organizations inside container camps and in tent camps to be used for healthcare and education. Today, according to the national GDP, he ranks number one on a global scale in terms of humanitarian aid provided. We are leading humanitarian and development projects in more than 140 countries around the world, and we are running many projects simultaneously. In 2002, the official development aid provided to other countries was in the region of $85 million, but in 2017, it reached $8.1 billion. Only these numbers are enough to point out to the fact that humanitarian aid is not a matter of wealth, but it's a matter of conscience. I'm speaking very clearly and frankly. Under the, in the root cause of many problems that we encounter, we never see the lack of resources, but we see lack of conscience and empathy and compassion. Innocent children are getting washed ashore and 
depictions of famine and hunger are clear confirmation of a lack of empathy and a lack of compassion. Despite all the development, despite all the progress, despite all the wealth that they have been enjoying, simple vaccinations are not provided to the refugees. And some of the countries are talking about harpooning the uh, dinghies used by the refugees trying to cross over the Mediterranean, seeking out for a better life in Europe. We have to talk about this, and we are encountering this lack of compassion and lack of conscience all together. Ladies and gentlemen, all of these conflicts and all of these crises and disasters are influencing us, the statesmen, as well as you, the members of organizations such as Red Crescent and Red Cross. Those who need help are primarily looking out for the banners of the Red Crescent or the Red Cross, regardless of where they are in the world. And you are the first ones to extend a helping hand to those in need. These organizations are deeply rooted in history. They are well established, and they are mobilizing their resources in times of disaster, famine, drought, and conflict. The humanitarian projects you are leading are mostly underrated and undersupported, and I'm well aware of that fact. While you are performing your duties, I'm well aware of the fact that you're facing tremendous challenges and you're surmounting many hurdles, and these facts are usually neglected and they are not well known. You are taking just a jar full of food and you are taking diapers to the babies and on your ways you see and you encounter many hurdles and many challenges which are of dire nature and many people around the world fail to comprehend that and humanitarian aid boils down to such personalities which do not distinguish between interests and benefits. It's all about compassion. It's all about taking up action on a voluntary basis. If you do not feel a sense of responsibility, you will never assume such risks, and you will never literally throw yourselves into the field where conflict is raging on. You are the ambassadors of heart. You are the warriors of compassion. In this day and age, human life is becoming more and more worthless, and everything is becoming more meaningful through finances, through money, and through value. And you are the symbols, you are the beacons of sacrifice in this day and age. I believe that each and every one of you are sustaining your duties with this understanding and with this mentality of the significance of your duty. In such actions, in such tremendous endeavors, trust and confidence is the most valuable asset. The slightest problem, the slightest delay in the exercising of humanitarian aid will pave the way to even greater suffering and pain. That's why in your activities, in your endeavors, accountability, transparency are of crucial significance. And similarly, coordination between different humanitarian aid agencies play a very vital role, which needs to be further strengthened. Due to an alignment, due to a lack of al alignment between different organizations, many resources are being spent in vain. And more than that, humanitarian crises are getting more and more widespread. Deaths are becoming much more prevalent and plagues are surrounding several territories. And I remember myself launching a very critical appeal the last time we got together in Istanbul. The destruction caused by the disasters in our geography, in order to eradicate the ramifications of such disasters, we need closer al alignment and we need a stronger coordination. These were the points that I have cordially drawn your attention to. And this appeal was 
welcomed by the OIC as the action plan for the 2020 and 2025 of the OIC were drafted only to be transposed into actions in the field. So this historical launch, this historical appeal was launched about three years ago, and it gives me great pleasure to be able to see that this appeal is now in fresh and blood, in flesh and blood, and it is being honored. And I would like to take the opportunity to thank the International Red Crescent and Red Cross Federation, along with International Red Crescent Committee and all of the stakeholders involved in the making such a tremendous change all around the world. We have more than 50 Red Crescent and Red Cross associations in the form of observers under this roof. And due to prior engagement, some of the associations could not make it here today. But thanks to the messages they have conveyed, they have clearly stated their support. Whether it be this one and whether it be the fourth summit of the international Red Crescent Committee. I hope and pray that our gathering will yield the most auspicious results and will be beneficial for the entire human race. May Allah be of aid to each and every one of you. I pray for you, and I would like to thank, your, thank you for your participation and your attendance. I would like to convey my most heartfelt emotions and respects to my brothers and sisters in your, in your homelands. May you always prevail. I entrust you in the hands of Allah. May health be with you. Uh, His Excellency the President, if you're kind enough not to step down from the podium, I would like to invite the President of Turkish uh, Red Crescent, uh, Mr. Kerem Kınık, to the microphone to present you with a token of appreciation. Ayrıca, uh, for the group photo, um, for security reasons, um, I kindly ask only the people who have been elected to come up to the stage, as we can't afford to have everyone on stage. So please, if you could come up to the stage for the group photo. Aile fotoğrafı için lütfen davet ediyorum sizi. Teşekkürler. If you could continue to the other sides, if that's possible. Yes, from the back. Thank you. Yes, thank you very much, His Excellency the President, for this very touching presentation. <laughs> and distinguished guests, Shortly, we'll be having a coffee break, and it will resume after half an hour for the forum. <laughs> 